Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis, and I'm excited to be joined today by Larry Dunn from no other than Earth, Wind & Fire, musical director for years and, and the awards. I mean, the accolades certainly uh, precede you. They're so well known. But I want to kind of roll the clock back and go back to the beginning, um, just really getting a sense of what it was like kind of growing up and starting to play instruments at the age of two. You were banging on your, your dad's keyboard. Uh, well... It was in the house. We had like an old, old raggedy upright. Uh -huh. And uh, like I said, I was drawn to it like a moth to the light. And I would sit there and beat on it. And I, I don't know, I must have been about, I don't know, five or six, maybe, when he taught me Blueberry Hill. Because mm. he played upright bass, guitar, and piano. Right. But his gig, he was an x-ray technician. Right. And then at night, a janitor. You got two jobs, man, and right. another one on his side. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, he taught me that, and I just, you know, I never stopped beating it. I think and in fourth grade, I got a guitar, mm -hmm. and I started learning uh, the Beatles stuff and Ray Charles. Uh, fifth grade, I wanted to be in the school band. And, uh, you know, I don't know about now, but back then the kids had a little bit more, you know, empathy for your, for your parents. So I knew they, they probably couldn't afford anything else, and they were giving away loaner instruments. From the school. It was cool, except the day that they were first giving them out, I was out with a sore throat. I was always getting sore throats. Hey, you're a doctor, right? So I, was, right. <laughs> I was always getting sore throats. So I was out that day, and the next day when I went back, the only instrument they had left was, what? A baritone horn. Right. And not, tell us about what that is, because that's not an instrument. I was going to say, it's not the baritone sax, which is the big wubbit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of like euphonium is another name for it. Okay. And it's kind of like a miniature tuba, kind of, you know. Got the, and the horn goes out like that. A couple of different styles. And what it really does is it plays beautiful secondary melodies. And that's all they had. And I was like, I'll take it. I just want to be in the band. And with the case, man, it was literally about that long, kind of thick. Mm -hmm. And I would carry it home every day. Loved it. Amazing. Just to be in the band. Right, just to be able to play. And so... Here you are, your parents are together. What is it like growing up at that time? You're an interracial couple. It's in the 50s. You're in Colorado. So what, what was that like? You, you frowned it up, man, already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what? It, it was very, it, like two, two points on that. 1950, uh, my mom was white-skinned Italian. My father was very dark. And in 1950, it was against the law. Mm to get married in Colorado. And I, like I often say, the millennials are like, that was like forever ago. <laughs> like, no, not, not that far back. And as we see, same nonsense goes on forever. But uh, so they had to go one state over to New Mexico. Wow. So the first two years was on the farm with my Italian grandparents from Calabria, my dad, my mom, and my older brother. And then they bought the house, I think when I was two, two and a half years old, something. And consequently, the neighborhood that we moved suburbia was awesome. We had dark-skinned black folks, we had light-skinned black, we had uh, white folks, we had uh, Hispanics, all. And there was a, a white woman across the street in a fourplex and upstairs that I couldn't wait to go every Wednesday and run up the stairs, and because she had a nice piano. Right. And I took three years of classical. And so it was awesome. And I say, if we are so evolved as, as, a, as a human race, why does it seem things are going backwards? But that's a whole nother show. Sure. No, so, okay. you know, I digress. <laughs> no, we may get to that. Um, so another issue and question that springs to mind is that you are supported by the parents in the beginning with respect to your music, but there's a point at which you sort of have to tell your dad, don't take away my music. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Well, you know, it's like I said, the older you get, you have a, a better understanding, of course, hopefully. Um, and I, like I told you the other night, they had to be very brave people to do that. I mean, even to this day, people get flack for doing that. So, he had kind of strayed a little bit, and we hadn't seen him for a minute. And so he showed up, and 
I had a gig to do that night with Philip Bailey and Hilliard Wilson, the guy that's still my bass player, plays with, he plays with everybody, but, and he had that thing, you ain't doing the gig. And mom gave that look like, hey, you're the one, so don't come home with the, with the attitude. And I didn't wear glasses, and I looked right at him, because, you know, he taught me Blue Ray and I said, look, you already messed up my life. You ain't taking my music. And he gave me that look like, this little boy's crazy, or something. And uh, he split. Do you think that this was related to just the stress of trying to make it as a musician or seeing you come up and do well, maybe there's some tension in that regards, or is it really related to interracial issues? Yeah, it, it, it could have been a lot of different things. I don't think it was that, because there was five of us, okay? And at that time, all five was there. So I had my older brother, who was six years older, then my younger brother, four years younger, and then my two baby sisters, and all of us were in like a little two-bedroom house. And uh, like I was saying, you know, who, who knows the mind of, of someone. Uh, but I'm sure all of it had interplay, you know, the biracial by thing. And, and he, like at the hospital, x-ray technician. Mm, so who knows? But uh, like I said, the older I got, and I, we got back in touch and we spoke. And, and I told him, I said, I'm, I'm still, I'm very proud that you're my dad. It means a lot. And I assume that he's also very proud of what you've done and that you're his son. Yeah, actually, but I, I heard this story that from my older brother, he used to always talk about you, and I'm like, it would've been nice if you'd have told me. <laughs> but, uh, you know, hey man, God bless him. Sure, sure. Early on, you meet Philip Bailey. He's literally like singing in the hallway, and you hear him, and you guys became friends super early on. Well, what it was is Philip and I went to school together, East High. Okay. But even before that, I think uh, my, my, my guy, Hilliard Wilson from Denver as well, amazing musician, bass player. He's played with and written for Prince. He's played with LL and, I mean, thousands of, hundreds of people at least. And we had a band when I was 11 and he was 13. And our band was instrumental. And we, so we were playing like um, Hugh Masekela, Grazing in the Grass, Jimmy Smith. Kenny Burrell, all that kind of stuff. And uh, at two sax, uh, alto, tenor, drummer, guitar, me on organ, and here you. And so they had a place out in Colorado that was called, uh, I think it was the Jackson Center. Okay. It's like a big warehouse where they let us folk go, right. the kids go on the weekend, and, and they had live bands. So we weren't playing that night, but they had uh, another band, and there was three gentlemen sitting on, on uh, stools, and they were doing this beautiful song by Curtis Mayfield, I think it was called In the Shadows. Yes. In the sh and you remember? And they were, mm -hmm. they were breaking the three-part harmony. Right. And we were like, wow. So we had a brainstorm. So we, so we got introduced. And so we took them with us and some of their band. And we had a big band. And we started playing all over, all over Denver. Right. Next thing, you all get sort of a big break. You hear that uh, Maurice White, his band is left. And you've got a band. How did that all come together to actually get to meet him and well, audition? Well, uh, the instigator was our dear buddy <laughs> Perry Jones. I don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah. Amazing guy. So by the time I was 15, my mom, God rest her soul, allowed me to play not once, not once, seven nights a week at this 21 and over black nightclub mm -hmm. with Hilliard and Philip and the guys. And so Perry Jones, who was a friend to the, the owners were Wayne Hightower, and Drake, his brother, and he was, uh, Wayne Hightower was one of the uh, Denver Rockets basketball mm -hmm. team at okay. that time. So they bought the club. And so we met this guy, Perry Jones, light-skinned brother from, I think, Des Moines, Iowa. Mm -hmm. Right, it, what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a real handsome cat, and he was slick. And I believe he was working at Warner Brothers at that time. So we would fly in and out and in and out. And one time he's like, you know what? We were backstage. First of all, you got super, two superstars. You got Philip and you got Larry. And he looked at me and said, you, you'll make somebody rich. <laughs> <laughs> talking about me? Ooh, well, that's a whole nother subject. Mm -hmm. But uh, so he knew Maurice and they were going back and forth. So Maurice with the older guys, you know, the first Earth and the Fire, they had two albums on Warner Brothers. 
So they came to Colorado and they played a gig at the Hilton Hotel in the daytime. Mm -hmm. And so we, oh, we had a band called Friends in Love. And so we opened up the show for them. And then Maurice and Verdine came down to that nightclub that night and saw us. Right. And about a year later, we broke up, they broke, her, they broke up. And, you know, right. we Philip said, I think we got the guy. Because mm -hmm. they went through a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Maurice remembered me. So they, they flew me out. And I learned both of the two albums at this point by ear. I mean, I read a little bit because of the horn and classical, but right. that, you know, I just learned by ear. And I flew out, Berdine picked me up, we went up to the house, I brought out the piano, did the Earth, Wind & Fire stuff, and then I went into a little bit of Herbie Hancock, Maiden Voyage. Oh, yeah. So you see, I can play jazz, yeah. Yeah. or whatever. And uh, the rest, as they say, was history. Sure. Did you feel like you had arrived? I mean, it was a group that you looked up to, and like I said, they had two albums out, and now you're accepted. Um, you know, the thing is, like we were talking about the other night, sometimes people, you can't just say the young pe people. It's like now, it's with the, with the internet and all these people, I want to find a job. And so what do they do? I want to see what pays the most. Right, right. And it's like, well, see, so you... you you went on, but it's like, I think I want brain surgery. That was a Fred Sanders said, I don't, I don't think, I don't like that. <laughs> but, you know, so, but instead of looking for something that you, first of all, you would enjoy doing. Because if you enjoy doing something, more than likely you would, well, you have a much better chance at being good at it. And so I felt that, yeah, this is a big step for sure. And I remember we were shooting a commercial for Pepsodent. And where we rehearsed on the, one of the lots, I think it was Warner Brothers, they had a big, gigantic set of teeth that was about eight feet high. And I'm always clowning, so <laughs> some kind of way I got up on top of them was just running back and forth. But then the thought did hit me. I said, you know what? This, this is gonna probably, this is probably gonna be really big. Now, of course, in your wildest imagination, you don't know what big is. And, uh, but I told people as we started traveling, and then I go to the East Coast and stuff, and and a couple of times the girls would be like, oh, they sound like cowboys. And we were making fun of their accent. Right. And then one time they said, oh, they just, they were talking to Philip and I, oh, they're, they're just regular people. Right. Where's Maurice, you know? <laughs> right, yeah. And, um, but the thing is, I told people, I said, people said, man, you're still the same cat. And I said, well, I guess spiritually, inherently, maybe I knew something but I just never looked at it as like, man, I don't know, then, now, and unfortunately, maybe forever, some of the entertainers, man, I'm on. Right. Never, I mean, never maybe you that. are. Right. But the thing is, uh, I found in my life, most people that are really good at what they do, nicest people. Right. It's the wannabes that look at me and I got, and here's my fleet of cars, and you know, and putting the cart before the horse. So the thing is, and especially the way that Earth would fire was able to change the lives of people, including our own. Right, right. You know, I remember one time we played a beautiful place in Detroit called Pine Knob, and um, we had just finished sound check, and his brother came up on the stage, I don't know where I got, but there was not a lot of people there. The band was just me and Maurice, everybody was gone. And he said, hey man, I wanna thank you, man, y'all got me off of heroin. And I looked at him, I said, no, we didn't. I said, God got you off of heroin. Our music was just a conduit. You know, you, you heard something in there. Keep your head to the sky. Or you're a shining star no matter who you are, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. Be ever wonderful. This is that challenge. You maintain your creativity and also are humble, but then at the same time, you're so perfectionist oriented. You are very rehearsal driven, work hard. How do you maintain that balance? Often it seems that people that may get too, too creative have a challenge just being able sometimes to just relax. Yeah, I, don't think, you, I don't think I was smart enough to be too, too <laughs> creative. Uh, but uh, so like I said, again, it's something you enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And I've said this a thousand times, and you even said, I, I heard you say that. 
And I will continue to say that. You take away Bill Whitten with those beautiful clothes that he designed, mm -hmm. Clive Davis and Columbia Records, The Big Machine, George Faison with, with the chore chore you know, the dancing and choreography and, and the bright lights and the lasers and all of that. And you take that off the table. The thing was, we rehearsed our butts off. And it wasn't a, man, we, man, I got to get out of here. Right. And I said, no, no, no. We would come in there, we would rehearse for months. And, and, and everybody was into it. You know, it's like after I left the, well, not people say, when did you leave? I didn't leave the fire. It's just, it kind of disbanded. And when we put it back together, we went something else. I had opened up our own corporation, my wife and I started doing stuff for Japanese television, and so just, you know, some things. And the good thing is that the music never ends, and people still, it's on generation after generation after generation, the songs live on. But uh, it is, it's a balance, but like I said, you have to make your choices. If you, a lot of people, they wanna be famous, and now we're, we're in the time where people wanna be famous for killing somebody. I mean, any it, there's no bars hold anything. You see these these high speed chases every day. And it's like you look. I know these are the IQs in the high single digits. Right. <laughs> you know the helicopters. Oh, you're gonna get caught. Right. But I'm sure that man, that's me, man. You get in the jail, man. That was me, man. On the road, what are some of the kinds of things that you all ran into or that you had to sort of face trying to keep the group together or dealing with the stresses of an intense tour schedule? Well. Uh, I told you we watched that Carpenters thing the other night, right? And after they, they had won the second Grammy or something close to you, and people were talking at Yin Yang, man, they, they made it overnight. Nobody makes it overnight. You know, you just, you just don't know what happened before that. And so when we first, first of all, in, in L.A., nobody knew who we were. And they, they had a couple of lightweight hits, you know, they had Fan the Fire with, you know, the other guys with the Warner Brother record and Sherry Scott, uh, I Think About Loving You. So we learned all that. And then we did the first album after with the new group with me and Philip and Ronnie Laws, Jessica Cleese, Roland Bautista, Ralph Johnson, Verdeen, um, and Andrew Woolfolk. And I think, yeah, that was the first one. And then Head to the Sky. So we started touring, I think it was about 73. And uh, we would fly to the East Coast. We'd rent three station wagons. And there was nine of us, right? right. Nine of us. <laughs> there was nine of us. So we'd take turns driving. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing a college circuit, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time you get back to the hotel at 10 o'clock, back then, NBC, ABC, CBS, it was, there was no TV. Right. It was that, that, that pattern sign with the Indian right, on right, it. Right, right. And so your best friend was your ghetto blaster. <laughs> and Denny's, with it, there was nothing open. You in North Carolina, there was nothing open. So you're praying that there might be a soda machine with maybe a, some cookies or some chips or something, and that was it. And so then, after we did that for years, then we went to, uh, to Europe and in Japan, and so it built up. We, we built, you know, you, from ground up. Right, And so by the time we were doing, by the, by the third year, whatever, and especially after that's the way to work, we, you're doing arenas, and then, you know, people see you in a limousine, and there's catered food, and, you know, you're doing about 200 something gigs a year, and you're flying, and, and people say, well, what a luxury, but at a certain point, and I'm sure you know this, Certain things are no longer a luxury. When you're working right. your booty off and, and you know getting not a lot of sleep and all that, you need the, the very least you need some decent food, right. and you need some rest, and you know you don't need to be yeah, <laughs> trying to <laughs> drive right, when, right. when you've done like uh, you know ten gigs in two days or whatever. I mean, we played at the uh, place in Philly. I can't remember, the Uptown Theater. It's all coming back. <laughs> And I remember we, had, we did five gigs in one day. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said. So Maurice takes ill. 
how does the group sort of find out about that and, and sort of deal and decide how you'll continue to manage on despite uh, him dealing with Parkinson's? Well, by that time, by the time I personally heard about it, the, the original group had disbanded. You know, I think the, the last tour with the real, with the main member, they call it the Classic Nine, uh, was 1982. And uh, Al had left, so Roland Bautista came back because he was on that first last days in time. But outside of that, it was the one before that was with Al, and then the last one was with Roland. And, uh, and there was nothing happening for a long time. And then Reese tried to put the group back together in 87, and Al and I declined, that's, that's in his book. And uh, so he put together a group, he had Sheldon Reynolds, and he had Sandy Emery, and a different drummer, and different stuff. And they were out touring, and Maurice looked great. But then we started hearing that, that Parkinson's had, was really taking over. And I don't remember what year it was when he finally stopped her, and I think it was, uh, no, it was sometime in the 90s, and he kind of handed it over to Philip. And God bless him, because I said, they still go all over the world. Well, they did before right. <laughs> oh, <there's laughs> Mr. COVID. COVID's right. uh, oh. And play our, the, you know, the original material and, and keeps, the, keeps the thrust going. Sure. This whole concept, you brought it up with that man that said you helped him get out for drugs, of, of really trying to help people and, and heal. Um, do, you, do you sense that the ability to maybe bring two races together and then also just, just elevate positivity was really something that, that helped the whole crossover piece of the group? Oh, absolutely. I mean, back in 71, I think it's when we got signed by Clive. And I remember at that point, Columbia Records was in the red. And then a few years, not a lot, a couple of years down the road, between Santana and EWF, we brought them out of the red. Mm -hmm. And I remember we played a gig at the Spectrum. So I remember we played there a few times. I mean, the first time was when we were opening for Gladys Knight and the Pips and the Four Tops. And the, the headliner was Gladys, Four Tops, and we were the openers. And that's like I say, nobody in L.A. knew us, so we're in the East Coast, and they turn down the lights. Earth, man! And 20,000 people were shaking the green things. Hey, right. man, I was like, come on. She said, were you scared? I said, no. You see 20, and like I said, because we're, we, we know what we're doing. We're ready to go, so that was awesome. But then, so we came back later when we were the headliners, and I remember some clown, excuse me, mm -hmm. wrote this article um, because that's the only thing he could find. There was a little scuffle across the street at the 7-Eleven, but we were the first group of any color or nationality to play the spectrum and had African Americans, whites, Latins, Asians, the whole gambit, and there was no issue. So this guy writes his little art. Well, there was a big fight across the street, a knife fight, and you found what you was looking for. So yeah, it, and it crossed all barriers. You know, Shining Star, what a, what a trip. You know, number one album, pop and R&B, that's the way of the world. Number one song, pop and R&B. And I didn't even realize a girlfriend of uh, Louisa and I let us know last year, you know, Shining Star was the only pop hit that EWF had. They're like, really? Tell me who I am. What do you feel is your most memorable moment, the thing you enjoy most in, in working with the group or Maurice? Yeah, that's a lot, but I remember <laughs> we played this thing called the California Jam. And that was before That's the Way They Were. That was, I think, 74. So I know Mighty Mighty was out and different stuff. And uh, it was a quarter of a million people. So they picked us up at the hotel and they flew us in helicopters. Don't like helicopters, because you, <laughs> you feel, you, you <laughs> talk about your booty tickling, and it's like, ah. <laughs> but it was awesome, they flew us in, and then they had it so together, because they had like, it was all day and night, so they had probably about 19 or 20 acts or more, I don't know. But it was brilliant, they had railroad track, mm -hmm. and they had every stage on the track. So when they would go from one band to the next, they would just move the stage. Right. I mean, it was very well done. Yeah. And so, yeah, you know, I, I think I was about, 19 or something then 
and and you look out there, and at this point, there's no stage fright for something like that because there's so many people, it doesn't even register. Okay. You know, and I remember Verdeen doing a bass solo, but a lot of the people, they had never seen us or heard us and of all the national, and they were like, who are these guys? And we were dressed all funny. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was awesome. Um, last question, Promise. What key message do you feel that you've tried to communicate through the music and through your creativity? Uh, it's, it's been the same, never changed. Whatever you do, put God first, have integrity, and, and respect. Respect people. How did you all get together? How did you all meet? <laughs> How I met Larry was at the Earth, Wind & Fire studio called The Complex. And I met him through one of the horn players, which is uh, uh, Michael Romley Davis. Michael Romley, why yeah, I know him. And he's the one who introduced us. Um, at that time, you know, Larry, he was married. I was a kid then. So was I. Yeah, you was I got married the first time when I was 17. My mom said... Yeah, my, not to me. My mom says, like, you know, you're too young. I think I know what I'm doing. <laughs> anyway, I digress. But. but anyway, so when I first saw him, all the guys introduced um, themselves, you know, to me and my girlfriend. I and, came out last. And you came out last. And Larry was behind the reception desk looking for something and kind of hiding and then... I saw those big brown eyes, and I said, oh, my gosh. And um, and I just knew right there. But um, I was too young. He was living his life. But I just, I just prayed. And I said, you know what, God? I just hope one day I can meet somebody just like him. Poor you. Yeah, uh -huh. just meet somebody just like this. I just felt a, 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 a spirit. Uh, like a connection and anointing and a, a, some like we had something before from I don't know from God I don't know I just felt something and uh, and from that moment on um, when he Larry has transitioned from the last situation we God just connected us back together it was uh, it was just um a ser I said serendipity, no, it was um, The a year blessing. was 1983. Yes. <laughs> it's when we uh, reconnected, and ever since, we've just been... And we... Still together. together. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the second question. How, what do you think the secrets are? What would you advise that you give to others to stay together, to thick and thin, and up and down, because it's so easy to just quit and call it a day? Well, I think, you know, actually, people say with a lot of stuff, there ain't no secret. Remember they talk the old adage, and I say this almost every week, right? The reason old adages become so is because they're true. Right. And so they're the one that says, there's no um, secret to success. Two words, hard work. So that, of course, hard work. But also, it's a matter of respect. and And, of course, you know, I remember uh, dear Fred Price, a wonderful pastor who I t took his cassettes all over the world when I was a kid. All of us, me, Philip, all of us. He just passed a few weeks ago, but he used to say, hey, man, you know, we could do, we have rights. And he, I remember he said it. I didn't say it. He said, if you don't look like Godzilla, you don't have to marry Godzilla. <laughs> and so the, <laughs> the good thing is that that's why there's all different types of people, because with, you know, like with Africa, there's a certain look. With European, there's a certain look. There's just different looks. And you, whatever fits your fancy is fine. So obviously she fit my fancy, and she's not wearing glasses, so she, I, I fit her fancy. I love his sense of, uh, sense of humor. And the, the main thing for me um, is the spirituality part that, that's really important. For me, and um, that you know, we have each other's back, and and where we encourage one another, and do everything with love, 
You may, there are some things you may not like about your partner. There may be some things that you love about your partner. You work it out as a couple and you grow in those things and just lift each other up. That's the main thing is just love each other. No matter the good, the bad, and the ugly, you work it together and have each other's back. Very like I was telling the doctor, I said, look, yeah. you know, people just get selfish, you know, but I said that that's a, that's a different kind of theory that, you know, you know, she just don't make me happy no more. I said, wow, I never realized that God put somebody on this very earth with their main gig in life to make you happy. You know, so nobody's perfect. No. Uh, well, no. <laughs> nobody's <laughs> perfect. But, and the thing is too, her sense of humor, I mean, she, she's out there. It makes she, me she's laugh. a New Yorker, man. So she's out there and, you know, with her, her Cuban, her father was a teacher in Cuba, and her mother was Puerto Rican. So she got that hot, you know, like, I love it when the veins in your neck bulge. But, uh, <laughs> but she's very, you know, she seemed very mild mannered, but she, she hot, you know. So we got together. I heard her singing, and she had did some stuff with Skip Scarborough, the amazing guy that wrote Would You Mind and Masquerade for Earth and many others. And uh, she was too young. Her mother said, you ain't going nowhere. And she was kind of shy, but I heard her sing. I said, "Look, you should really work on that." And uh, we did a little demo, and I was like, "Wow!" I said, "Look, so you can do that, or you can do this. Work for the man." <laughs> and uh, she's like, "Okay." And now, like I said, she's worked with Ronnie Laws, uh, the, uh, El Chicano, different people, on and on and on and on. And then, like I said, we had a ball doing all those commercials, and her voice was like a chameleon. You know, she did the opera thing, she did different stuff, she got a low range or a high range. And we have fun doing that, you know, as well, doing the music together. But a lot of times, she's so brilliant because she does all the corporation stuff. She's got like a, a, a thing about the size of this whole thing here that's full of ledgers that, because she makes copies of everything, she knows the numbers. So it's amazing, you know, we both work and uh, complement each other. And our main thing, like my grandma said, no matter what you do in life, put God first. Yes, and pray for each other. No matter what you go through in life, and if you are, you know, going through situation, family situation, you know, pray for the family, pray for each other, and lift each other up, no matter what. You know, um, you may go through your your battles, but. God fights your battles. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we pray for the, yeah. pray for everybody. <laughs> pray yeah, for pray the world. Pray for the world. Yes, it's a, it's a lot going on. Yes, so I'm very blessed. Very blessed, and and I pray for this. I I said a long time ago. I said, God, send me somebody who has a heart, who is spiritually grounded, and I said somebody who don't like sports. <laughs> I'll be. But he does. I like we, sports. Yeah, we play. She beat me a couple times with heels on when I was playing in, uh, basketball up at Indigo Ranch. And, you know, the man, well, look, I was just tired. I mean. <laughs> but uh, but we have junkies out there who are just all day with the yeah, team. Yeah, we like sports, sports, but... We love sports, but, I'm but not, it's just you know, I'm not a, how you say, addict. Fanatic. Fanatic. No, I told my brothers, brothers-in-law in Denver years <laughs> ago, because they screaming at the TV like Al Bundy with that nothing else on. They was Little League. And I said, look, see all those guys up there with the shorts and... I said, they're getting paid. <laughs> we still working on ways for us to get paid. Yeah, and it uh, just so happens music is how we do it. 